one Sunday when Joe, greatly enjoying his pipe, had so plumed himself on being most awful dull that I had given him up for the day. I lay on the earthwork for some time with Joe, said I, don't you think I ought to make Miss Havisham a visit? Well, Pip, returned Joe, slowly considering. What for? What for, Joe? What is any visit made for? There is some wizards, perhaps, said Joe, as forever remains open to the question. Pip. But in regard to visiting Miss Havisham, she might think you wanted something, expected something of her. Don't you think I might say that I did not, Joe? You might, old chap, said Joe. And she might credit it. Similarly, she might, Joe felt, as I did, that he had made a point there, and he pulled hard at his pipe to keep himself from weakening it by repetition. You see, Pip, Joe pursued, as soon as he was past that danger, Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you. When Miss Havisham done the handsome thing by you, she called me back to say to me as that were all. Yes, Joe, I heard her. All, Joe repeated very emphatically. Yes, Joe, I tell you, I heard her, which I meant to say. Pip, it might be that her meaning were, make an end on it, as you was, me to the north and you to the south, but, Joe, yes, old chap, here am I getting on in the first year of my time, and since the day of my being bound, I have never thanked Miss Havisham, or, or even, said he, if he was helped to knocking her up a new chain for the front door, or say a gross or two of shark-headed screws for general use, or some light fancy article. Well, said Joe, still harping on it as though I had particularly pressed it, if I was yourself, Pip, I wouldn't. No, I would not. For what's a door chain when she's got one always up, and shark headers is open to misrepresentations? And if it was a toasting fork, you'd go into brass and do yourself no credit. And the uncommonest workman can't show himself uncommon in a gridiron, for a gridiron is a gridiron, said Joe, steadfastly impressing it upon me, as if he were endeavour. I never thought of making Miss Havisham any present. No, Pip. Joe assented as if he had been contending for that, all along, and what I say to you is you are right. It was a slip of mine. What do you think of it, Joe? In brief, Joe thought that if I thought well of it, he thought well of it. But, he was particular in stipulating that if I were not received with cordiality, or if I were not encouraged to repeat my visit as a visit which had no ulterior object but was simply one of by these conditions I promised to abide. Now, Joe kept a journeyman at weekly wages whose name was Orlick. He pretended that his Christian name was Dolge, a clear impossibility, but he was a fellow of that obstinate disposition that I believe him to have been the prey of no delusion in this particular, but willfully. He was a broad-shouldered, loose-limbed, swarthy fellow of great strength, never in a hurry, and always slouching. He never even seemed to come to his work on purpose, but would slutch in as if by mere accident. And when he went to the jolly bargeman to eat his dinner, or went away at night, he, he lodged at a sluice keeper's out on the marshes, and on working days would come slouching from his hermitage, with his hands in his pockets and his dinner loosely tied in a bundle round him. On Sundays he mostly lay all day on the sluice gates, or stood against ricks and barns. He always slouched, locomotively, with his eyes on the ground, and when accosted or otherwise required to raise them, he looked up in a half-resentful, half-puzzled way. This morrow's journeyman had no liking for me. When I was very small and timid, he gave me to understand that the devil lived in a black corner of the forge, and that he knew the fiend very well, also that it was necessary to make up. When I became Joe's prentice, Orlick was perhaps confirmed in some suspicion that I should displace him, howbeit he liked me still less. Not that he ever said anything, or did anything, openly importing hostility. I only noticed that he always beat his sparks in my direction, and that whenever I sang old clan, Dulge Orlick was at work and present next day, when I reminded Joe of my half-holiday. 
He said nothing at the moment, for he and Joe had just got a piece of hot iron between them, and I was at the bellows. But by and by he said, leaning on his hammer, If young Pip has a half-holiday, do as much for old Orlick. I suppose he was about five and twenty, but he usually spoke of himself as an ancient person. Why, what'll you do with a half-holiday, if you get it, said Joe. What'll I do with it, what'll he do with it? I'll do as much with it as him, said Orlick. As to Pip, he's going uptown, said Joe. Well then, as to old Orlick, he's a-going uptown, retorted that worthy. Two can go uptown. Taint only one watt can go uptown. Don't lose your temper, said Joe. Shall if I like growled Orlick. Some and they're uptowning. Now, master, come. No favoring in this shop. Be a man, the master refusing to entertain the subject until the journeyman was in a better temper. Orlick plunged at the furnace, drew out a red-hot bar, made at me with, Ah, I am all right, said gruff old Orlick. Then, as in general you stick to your work as well as most men, said Joe, let it be a half-holiday for all. My sister had been standing silent in the yard, within hearing, like you, you fool said she to Joe, giving holidays to great idle hulkers like that. You are a rich man, upon my life, to waste wages in that way. I wish I was his master. You'd be everybody's master, if you durst, retorted Orlick with an ill-favored grin. Let her alone, said Joe. I'd be a match for all noodles and all rogues, returned my sister beginning to work herself into a mighty rage. And I couldn't be a match for the noodles, without being a match for your master, who's the dunder-headed king of the noodles. And I couldn't be a match for the rogues, without being a match for you, who are the blackest-looking and the worst rogue between this and France. Now, Uriah Fell Shrew, Mother Gargery, rolled the journeyman. If that makes a judge of rogues, you ought to be a good un- let her alone, will you, said Joe. What did you say, cried my sister, beginning to scream. What did you say? What did that fellow Orlick say to me, Pip? What did he call me, with my husband standing by? Oh, 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 each of you, I'd hold you under the pump, and choke it out of you. I tell you, let her alone, said Joe. Oh, to hear him, cried my sister, with a clap of her hand, to hear the names he's giving me that Orlick, in my own house, me, a married woman, with my husband standing by, oh, oh, hear my sister, being by this time a perfect fury and a complete success. She made a dash at the door which I had fortunately locked. What could the wretch Joe do now, after his disregarded parenthetical interruptions? but stand up to his journeyman, and ask him what he meant by interfering betwixt himself and Mrs. Joe, and further whether he was man enough to come on. Old Orlick felt that the situation admitted of nothing less than coming on, and was on his defence straightway. So, but, if any man in that neighbourhood could stand up long against Joe, I never saw the man. Orlick, as if he had been of no more account than the pale young gentleman, was very soon among the coal dust, and in no hurry to come out of it. Then Joe unlocked the door and picked up my sister, who had dropped insensible at the window, but who had seen the fight first, I think, and who was carried into the house and laid down, and who... Then came that singular calm and silence which succeed all uproars. And then, with the vague sensation which I have always connected with such a lull, namely, that it was Sunday, Illustration when I came down again, I found Joe and Orlick sweeping up, without any other traces of discomposure than a slit in one of Orlick's nostrils, which was neither expressed. A pot of beer had appeared from the jolly bargeman, and they were sharing it by turns in a peaceable manner. The lull had a sedative and philosophical influence on Joe, who followed me out into the road to say, as a parting observation that might do me good on the rampage pip and off the rampage. Nor, 
how I passed and repassed the gate many times before I could make up my mind to ring, nor how I debated whether I should go away without ringing, nor how I should undoubtedly have gone, if my time had been my own to come back. Miss Sarah Pocket came to the gate. No, Estella. How, then? You hear again, said Miss Pocket. What do you want? When I said that I only came to see how Miss Havisham was, Sarah evidently deliberated whether or no she should send me about my business. But unwilling to hazard the responsibility, she let me in, and presently brought the sharp message that I was to come up. Everything was unchanged, and Miss Havisham was alone. Well, said she, fixing her eyes upon me, I hope you want nothing. You'll get nothing. No, indeed, Miss Havisham. I only wanted you to know that I am doing very well in my apprenticeship, and am always much obliged to you. There, there, with the old restless fingers. Come now and then. Come on your birthday. Eh, she cried suddenly, turning herself and her chair towards me. You are looking round for Estella. He? Abroad, said Miss Havisham. Educating for a lady, far out of reach. Prettier than ever, admired by all who see her. Do you feel that you have lost her? There was such a malignant enjoyment in her utterance of the last words, and she broke into such a disagreeable laugh that I was at a loss what to say. She spared me the trouble of considering by dismissing me. When the gate was closed upon me by Sarah of the Walnut Shell Countenance, I felt more than ever dissatisfied with my home and with my trade and with everything. And that was all I took by that motion. As I was loitering along the high street, looking in disconsolately at the shop windows, and thinking what I would buy if I were a gentleman, who should come out of the bookshop but Mr. Wopsle. Mr. Wopsle had in his hand the affecting tragedy of George Barnwell, in which he had that moment invested sixpence, with the view of heaping every word of it on the head of Pumblecook, with whom no sooner did he see me then he appeared to consider that a special providence had put apprentice in his way to be read at, and he laid hold of me, and insisted on my accompanying him to, as I knew it would be miserable at home, and as the nights were dark and the way was dreary, and almost any companionship on the road was better than none, I made no great resistance. As I never assisted at any other representation of George Barnwell, I don't know how long it may usually take but I know very well that it took until half-past nine o'clock that night. Wopsel got into Newgate. I thought he never would go to the scaffold. He became so much slower than at any former period of his disgraceful career. I thought it a little too much that he should complain of being cut short in his flower after all, as if he had not been running to seed, leaf after leaf, ever since his course began. This, however, was a mere question of length and wearisomeness. What stung me was the identification of the whole affair with my unoffending self. When Barnwell began to go wrong, I declare that I felt positively apologetic. Pumblecook's indignant stare so taxed me with it. Wopsel, too, took pains to present me in the worst light. At once ferocious and maudlin, I was made to murder my uncle with no extenuating circumstances whatever. Mill would put me down in argument on every occasion. Even after I was happily hanged and Wopsle had closed the book, Pumblecook sat staring at me, and shaking his head, and saying, Take warning, boy, take warning. It was a very dark night when it was all over, and when I set out with Mr. Wopsle on the walk home. Beyond town, we found a heavy mist out, and it fell wet and thick. The turnpike lamp was a blur, quite out of the lamp's usual place apparently, and its rays looked solid substance on the fog. We were noticing this, and saying how that the mist rose with a change of wind from a certain quarter of our marshes, when we came upon a man, slouching under the lee of the turnpike house. Hello, we said, stopping. Orlick there, ah, uh, he answered, 
slouching out. I was standing by a minute, on the chance of company. You are late, I remarked. Orlick not unnaturally answered. Well, and you were late. We have been, said Mr. Wopsle, exalted with his late performance. We have been indulging, Mr. Orlick, in an intellectual evening. Old Orlick growled, as if he had nothing to say about that, and we all went on together. I asked him presently whether he had been spending his half-holiday up and down town. Yes, said he, all of it. I come in behind yourself. I didn't see you, but I must have been pretty close behind you. By the by, the guns is going again. At the hulks, said I. A. Hey, there's some of the birds flown from the cages. The guns have been going since dark about. You will hear one presently. In effect, we had not walked many yards further, when the well-remembered boom came towards us, deadened by the mist, and heavily rolled away along the low. A good night for cutting off in, said Orlick. We'd be puzzled how to bring down a jailbird on the wing. Tonight, the subject was a suggestive one to me, and I thought about it in silence. Mr. Wopsle, as the ill-requited uncle of the evening's tragedy, fell to meditating aloud in his garden at Camberwell. Orlick, with his hands in his pockets, slouched heavily at my side. It was very dark, very wet, very muddy, and so we splashed along. Now and then, the sound of the signal cannon broke upon us again, and again rolled sulkily along the course of the river. I kept myself to myself and my thoughts. Mr. Wopsle died amiably at Camberwell, and exceedingly game on Bosworth Field, and in the greatest agonies at Glastonbury. Orlick sometimes growled, beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a clink for the stout, old Clem, I thought he had been drinking, but he was not drunk. Thus, we came to the village. The way by which we approached it took us past the three jolly bargemen, which we were surprised to find it being eleven o'clock, in a state of commotion, with the door wide open. Mr. Wopsle dropped in to ask what was the matter, surmising that a convict had been taken, but came running out in a great hurry. There's something wrong, said he, without stopping. Up at your place, Pip. Run all, what is it? I asked, keeping up with him. So did Orlick at my side. I can't quite understand. The house seems to have been violently entered when Joe Gargery was out. Supposed by convicts. Somebody has been attacked and hurt. We were running too fast to admit of more being said, and we made no stop until we got into our kitchen. It was full of people. The whole village was there, or in the yard, and there was a surgeon, and there was Joe, and there were a group of women, all on the floor in the midst of the kitchen. The unemployed bystanders drew back when they saw me, and so I became aware of my sister, lying without sense or movement on the bare boards where she had been knocked down by a tremendous blow on the back. Chapter X. With my head full of George Barnwell. I was at first disposed to believe that I must have had some hand in the attack upon my sister, or at all events that as her near relation, popularly, but when, in the clearer light of next morning, I began to reconsider the matter and to hear it discussed around me on all sides, I took another view of the case, which was more reasonable. Joe had been at the three jolly bargemen smoking his pipe, from a quarter after eight o'clock to a quarter before ten. While he was there, my sister had been seen standing at the kitchen door, and had exchanged good night with a farm laborer going home. The man could not be more particular as to the time at which he saw her. He got into dense confusion when he tried to be, 
than that it must have been before nine. When Joe went home at five minutes before ten, he found her struck down on the floor and promptly called in assistance. The fire had not then burnt unusually low, nor was the snuff of the candle very long. The candle, however, had been blown out. Nothing had been taken away from any part of the house. Neither, beyond the blowing out of the candle, which stood on a table between the door and my sister, and was behind her when she stood facing the fire and was struck, was there any disarrangement? But there was one remarkable piece of evidence on the spot. She had been struck with something blunt and heavy on the head and spine. After the blows were dealt, something heavy had been thrown down at her with considerable violence as she lay on her and on the ground beside her when Joe picked her up was a convict's leg iron which had been filed asunder. Now, Joe, examining this iron with a smith's eye, declared it to have been filed asunder some time ago. The hue and cry going off to the hulks, and people coming thence to examine the iron, Joe's opinion was corroborated. They did not undertake to say when it had left the prison ships to which it undoubtedly had once belonged, but they claimed to know for certain that that particular manacle had not been worn by either of the two convicts who, further, one of those two was already retaken, and had not freed himself of his iron. Knowing what I knew, I set up an inference of my own here. I believe the iron to be my convict's iron, the iron I had seen and heard him filing at on the marshes, but my mind did not accuse him of having put it to its latest use. For I believed one of two other persons to have become possessed of it, and to have turned it to this cruel account, either Orlick or the strange man who had shown me the file. Now, as to Orlick, he had gone to town exactly as he told us when we picked him up at the turnpike. He had been seen about town all the evening. He had been in divers companies in several Wapsle. There was nothing against him save the quarrel. And my sister had quarreled with him, and with everybody else about her, ten thousand times. As to the strange man, if he had come back for his two bank notes there could have been no dispute about them, because my sister was fully prepared to restore them. Besides, there had been no altercation. The assailant had come in so silently and suddenly that she had been felled before she could look round. It was horrible to think that I had provided the weapon, however undesignedly, but I could hardly think otherwise. I suffered unspeakable trouble while I considered and reconsidered whether I should at last dissolve that spell of my childhood and tell Joe all the story. For months afterwards, I every day settled the question finally in the negative, and reopened and reargued it next morning. The contention came, after all, to this. The secret was such an old one now, had so grown into me and become a part of myself, that I could not tear it away. In addition to the dread that, having led up to so much mischief, it would be now more likely than ever to alienate Joe from me if he believed it, I had a further restraining dread that he would not believe However, I temporized with myself, of course, for, was I not wavering between right and wrong, when the thing is always done, and resolved to make a full disclosure if I should see the constables and the Bow Street men from London, for, this happened in the days of the extinct red waistcoated police, were about the house for a week or two, and did pretty much what I have heard. They took up several obviously wrong people and they ran their heads very hard against wrong ideas, and persisted in trying to fit the circumstances to the ideas, instead of trying. Also, they stood about the door of the jolly bargemen, with knowing and reserved looks that filled the whole neighborhood with admiration, and they had a mysterious manner of taking their drink, that, but not quite, for they never did it. Long after these constitutional powers had dispersed, my sister lay very ill in bed. Her sight was disturbed, so that she saw objects multiplied, and grasped at visionary teacups and wine-glasses instead of the realities. Her hearing was greatly impaired, when, at last, she came round so far as to be helped downstairs, it was still necessary to keep my slate always by her, that she might indicate in writing what she could not indicate. As she was very bad handwriting apart, a more than indifferent speller, 
and as Joe was a more than indifferent reader, extraordinary complications arose between them which I was always called the administration of mutton instead of medicine, the substitution of tea for Joe, and the baker for bacon, were among the mildest of my own mistakes. However, her temper was greatly improved, and she was patient. A tremulous uncertainty of the action of all her limbs soon became a part of her regular state, and afterwards, at intervals of two or three months, she would often put her hands to her head. We were at a loss to find a suitable attendant for her, until a circumstance happened conveniently to relieve us. Mr. 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 Wopsle's great aunt conquered a confirmed habit of living into which she had fallen, and Biddy became a part of our establishment. It may have been about a month after my sister's reappearance in the kitchen, when Biddy came to us with a small speckled box containing the whole of her worldly effects, and became a blessing to the household. Above all, she was a blessing to Joe, for the dear old fellow was sadly cut up by the constant contemplation of the wreck of his wife, and had been accustomed, while attending on her of an evening. It was characteristic of the police people that they had all more or less suspected poor Joe, though he never knew it, and that they had to a man concurred in regarding him as one of the deepest spirits they had ever Biddy's first triumph in her new office was to solve a difficulty that had completely vanquished me. I had tried hard at it, but had made nothing of it. Thus it was. Again and again and again, my sister had traced upon the slate a character that looked like a curious, and then with the utmost eagerness had called our I had in vain tried everything producible that began with a tea from tar to toast and tub. At length it had come into my head that the sign looked like a hammer, and on my lustily calling that word in my sister's ear, she had begun to hammer on the table and had expressed a qualified assent. Thereupon, I had brought in all our hammers one after another, but without avail. Then I bethought me of a crutch, the shape being much the same, and I borrowed one in the village, and displayed it to my sister with considerable confidence. But she shook her head to that extent when she was shown it, that we were terrified lest in her weak and shattered state she should dislocate her neck. When my sister found that Biddy was very quick to understand her, this mysterious sign reappeared on the slate. Biddy looked thoughtfully at it, heard my explanation, looked thoughtfully at my sister, looked thoughtfully at Joe who was always represented on the slate by his initial letter, and ran in. Why, of course, cried Biddy, with an exultant face. Don't you see? It's him, or like without a doubt she had lost his name, and could only signify him by his hammer. We told him why we wanted him to come into the kitchen, and he slowly laid down his hammer, wiped his brow with his arm, took another wipe at it with his apron, and came slouching out, I confess that I expected to see my sister denounce him, and that I was disappointed by the different result. She manifested the greatest anxiety to be on good terms with him, was evidently much pleased by his being at length produced, and motioned that she would have him given something to drink. She watched his countenance as if she were particularly wishful to be assured that he took kindly to his reception. She showed every possible desire to conciliate him, and there was an air of humble propitiation. After that day, a day rarely passed without her drawing the hammer on her slate, and without Orlick's slouching in and standing doggedly before her, as if he knew no more than I did what to make. Chapter Xlia. I now fell into a regular routine of apprenticeship life, which was varied beyond the limits of the village and the marshes, by no more remarkable circumstance than the arrival of my birthday and my I found Miss Sarah Pocket still on duty at the gate. I found Miss Havisham just as I had left her, and she spoke of Estella in the very same way, if not in the very same The interview lasted but a few minutes, and she gave me a guinea when I was going, and told me to come again on my next birthday. I may mention at once that this became an annual custom. I tried to decline taking the guinea on the first occasion, but with no better effect than causing her to ask me very angrily, if I expected more then, and after that I took it. 
so unchanging was the dull old house, the yellow light in the darkened room, the faded specter in the chair by the dressing-table glass, that I felt as if the stopping of the clocks had stopped 